this is what you're going to actually do today is bacterial transformation. So you're going to transform bacteria today. And we're using a system, it's actually a kit that we purchased from BioRad. Um, so it's copyrighted. Uh, it's known as the P-Glow system, and you can figure out why it's called Glow, right? They're going to glow, right? P stands for plasmid, and that's the form the DNA is in that we're going to use today. So some examples of transformation. So this is where you're adding DNA to an organism and changing their characteristics. You're literally transforming them, right? So for these, these three blind mice, right, not really, but maybe, you notice their eyes definitely, right, their um, ears, their nose, even their tails are glowing fluorescent green. The reason for that is that they were given this protein, the DNA, on how to make this protein known as green fluorescent protein, which is what we're going to work with today. This allows them, when exposed to UV light, to fluoresce green. You'll notice that either he's a control or it didn't work in him. Right? But we can see by just looking at the organism that they were changed at the DNA level. Right? This is not normal. Of course, you can even have some fun with this. This picture here, and we've done similar things like this with the kids over the summer in the summer program. Um, this is bacteria on a petri dish that express the different fluorescent proteins, right? So this one's expressing this bacteria is, is red and green and, and blue and orange and like a pink color. So they, these are each different transformed bacteria with the different proteins. And somebody, you know, had a little bit of fun and literally drew on the plate. And I usually do this uh, sometimes too, like especially uh, when it's Halloween time, I'll, I'll take our green fluorescent protein and I'll draw a jack-o'-lantern on a petri dish, right, a jack-o'-lantern face, right? So you can, you can do uh, fun things with it. Uh, but, yeah, that's fun, right? What would be a real-world practice? What's, what's beneficial about making, especially a microscopic organism, right, like these bacteria, where we know for sure that these are different bacteria because they're different colors, right? Why would that be beneficial to have them, when we shine UV light on them, for them to fluoresce? You know one from the other, right? We can differentiate them by just looking at them. So your unknowns right now, right? You're wishing, you're like, man, I wish mine had red fluorescent protein, right? And that would make it really easy because when we just shine UV light on it, we could see any contamination, right? or see that it's yours because we know it's supposed to be red or green or blue. But right now, they all look pretty much the same, right? You guys are all kind of like this white or translucent bacteria, right? You're like, really? Is mine different from my lab partners? Is it really different, Miss Erica? I'm like, yes, it is different. Although some of you guys, if you found out, do have the same, right? <laughs> and, and within the class, right, some people are given the same organism. So this is one of my favorite videos, especially when you show it to kids, because the minute you say sperm, they pay attention, <laughs> right? So this is a really cool um, experiment that they did. And uh, so it made Science World. And what you are watching here, and I'll blow it up even, it's a very short video. It's only nine seconds. So I'll play it a couple of times. What you're seeing are sperm, uh, uh, fruit fly sperm to be specific, um, and they're in the reproductive tract of the female. Now you can really see the green ones, right, because they're pretty bright and they're not as numerous. But look closely, you see the red ones? What they did is that they genetically modified one male fruit fly to produce green fluorescent sperm. Right, so that they would express green fluorescent protein in his sperm. And another male fruit, fruit fly made it express red fluorescent protein. So you're able to see here that obviously she mated with both of them, right? This is what they do. 
female fruit flies will mate with multiple males, right? Have multiple sperm swimming around in her reproductive tract. For her, this is advantageous because her children will be diverse, right? And so therefore more likely to survive in the environment. If your children are different, if they're all the same, right? Then something could potentially wipe them all out, right? If they're all the same. It's variation, right, that allows us to still exist. If we were all exactly the same, right, something like a virus could wipe every single one of us out. When viruses hit, right, they don't affect all people the same ways because we're not all genetically the same. We have variation, okay? So it's her benefit to do this, right, to mate with multiple sperm, and they can really, we literally can see it, right? We can see what she's done. This naughty little girl, huh. right? And then they studied this even further and come to find out, obviously, the sperm are competing to get to the egg. They literally will compete with each other, try and stop each other from getting to the egg. They'll work together. But she actually produces chemicals in her system that help decrease that competition because, again, there's a reason why she's doing that. She wants her children to be from multiple males. She wants them to be diverse genetically. But, you know, we couldn't, this is a pretty simplistic question, right? Very, you know, but very sophisticated to a certain extent. You know, not so much anymore. Being able to genetically alter in this way so that you could physically see what's happening in that reproductive tract. So this has been used, this type of you could say genetic labeling or tagging, making things produce these green fluorescent proteins has been widely used in research nowadays to, again, help us visualize the different things that are happening in different disease states, right, uh, and lots of other questions that we want to know the answers to um, has really helped in the visualization. So other than it's really cool, right, to make E. coli green, there's a practical real-world application to why you would want to make a microscopic organism of fluorescent color, right, is to help be able to follow and identify it. So that's what we're going to do today. This does happen in nature too, and this is one of the ways that bacteria can genetically alter themselves and make themselves different and benefit from DNA that's in the environment. Um, bacteria, when they die, their DNA becomes part of the environment. Other bacteria have um, the ability to pick up that DNA and then incorporate it into their cells. And that's what we're going to do today is we're going to introduce DNA into the test tube where the bacteria are. We're going to do certain things to manipulate and encourage them to take in that DNA, right, to actually take it inside the cell. If they actually take it in and use it, that cell is said to be transformed. So not much different than transformers, right? Right? Everyone knows about transformers that go from a car to some alien robot thing. Right? My son is convinced whoever's driving, driving that Camaro around New Orleans is Bumblebee, trying to explain to a kid that it's not going to turn into an alien robot. Um, that it's make-believe, but who knows, someday that might be a real thing, right? <laughs> no, no. Um, but yeah, we can, we can make transformations. We can go from, you know, plain old E. coli to, you know, something alien like a robot um, where it, it fluoresces um, green under UV light because of a protein that it makes from that DNA code we're going to give it. All right, so in essence, transformation means a cell that takes up a portion of DNA from another organism and it integrates it into its own chromosome. Um, they don't always uh, integrate into the chromosome. What we're going to do today is give it a plasmid. It's a circular piece of DNA, and it's actually going to stay out of their circular chromosome. It's going to stay separate. So why is this an active area of research transformation? And, and one of the scary things I said is this happens in nature, right? We can cause it to happen in a lab, but we found out because it happened in nature. And uh, Frederick Griffith actually discovered this, and this is one of those things that led to us discovering that DNA was the genetic material, even, um, in cells. But unfortunately, over the years, and since this PowerPoint has been written, 
There has been a major superbug discovered, a bacteria that is resistant to all known antibiotics. No, no, no. But there are strains of gonorrhea that are resistant to uh, the most commonly used antibiotic, which I can't remember which it is. Yes, gonorrhea is a bacteria that causes a sexually transmitted disease. Uh, and unfortunately, that organism changes so frequently that if you get the infection more than once because you don't develop immunity to it, uh, but typically it was treated by antibiotics, uh, but that is becoming more difficult because there are bacteria out there now that have genetically changed and that are resistant to the antibiotics. So, for instance, this Klebsiella pneumoniae infection um, that was found um, in a Swedish man while he was in India, you can close the door, was resistant to a particular group of antibiotics that was usually treated for this type of infection, right? So they did some investigating, right? This antibiotic is similar to um, one we're going to use today. It has this beta-lactam ring in it. And so ampicillin, penicillin, right? Penicillin is the natural form, and then ampicillin is a modified form of penicillin. Both of these have this beta-lactam ring, okay? And they have found that this organism, and so this is the name of the gene, so the actual code of DNA that codes for this protein they named New Delhi Mentilla Beta Lactamase. And we're gonna use a similar enzyme today, or DNA code, for an enzyme in this group. It's a beta-lactamase. Beta-lactam referring to this ring structure right here. So guess what this enzyme does to that ring structure? It breaks it. And it, when it does that, it deactivates this antibiotic. So these bacteria have the DNA, the information, right? And that segment of information is referred to as a gene that codes for that protein that's an enzyme that destroys this class of drugs, penicillin, ampicillin, all the ones with these beta-lactam rings. This information is encoded in their DNA. So guess what? Say that cell dies and that DNA becomes part of the environment. Can somebody, other bacteria come along and pick it up? Yeah, and they have, right? So in this way, resistance has spread. This is one of the ways that this information has been shared among bacteria and resistance has spread to antibiotics, where they can destroy the antibiotic so it has no effect on them. Does that make sense to you guys? So the other thing is people use this term wrong a lot of times, right? You don't become resistant to antibiotics. The bacteria become resistant to the antibiotics. Okay? Um... So I'm trying to think. Yeah. So this is referred to also as horizontal gene transfer. So information is going from one type of bacteria to another. Right? That's horizontal transfer, going from one bacteria to another. Um, so this is the timeline. So they looked at 180 different bacteria or they looked at several different bacteria, um, they found 180 isolates of bacteria that had beta-galactinase ability, right? So they had this DNA, they have the ability to produce this um, enzyme, which is not good. Um, and others have become resistant to other types of antibiotics as well. So the one that most of you guys are familiar with is MRSA, right? Some people say MRSA. It's not a word, y'all, but we try to make it a word to make it easier to say instead of saying M-R-S-A, right? They say MRSA. It's really not a word, right? It's an acronym, right? Each letter stands for something. It's Mictalin Resistant Staphylococcus aureus. It is a strain of Staph aureus out there that is re resistant to mycticillin which is a penicillin-like drug that was commonly used for, quote-unquote, staph infections. 
The problem is that somehow along the way it developed resistance. I can't remember exactly if it has beta-galactinase or something else that allows it to be resistant to these type of drugs, but it is. Right? So then we start using other types of drugs. So nowadays we have VRSA. Anyone know what that stands for? Vancomycin resistant Staphylococcus aureus, right? So they started using vancomycin, and then we found out, guess what? There's a strain that's developed now that's resistant to that. The really scary thing with tuberculosis, when you get to that one, because of it being a mycobacteria, a slow grower, grows inside macrophages, right? Inside the lungs of people who are infected. The slow growing uh, disease. So there's a lot of different drugs they will give. Like typically when someone has tuberculosis, they give them a cocktail of like three or four drugs. Resistance has built up so much for tuberculosis that there are strains out there that are multi-drug resistant and extremely, extremely resistant, extremely multi-drug resistant. So that's the highest level. So in other words, if someone has that strain, they're probably down to like two antibiotics that'll work. All right, so we might get to a point where we end up with mycobacteria tuberculosis that is resistant to all the drugs we currently have available to us. That is the world that we're very closely going to be in, very, very rapidly approaching. Well, I mean, the, the scary thing is, is in, and do and you guys remember where we get antibiotics from? From nature, from other microorganisms that are fighting these microorganisms, stolen technology. So there's a big worldwide initiative, which I got trained in this summer and I want to start doing here at Delgado, is having microbiology students try and isolate bacteria from the soil in the hopes of trying to find new antibiotic producing bacteria. Or not even necessarily new bacteria, but maybe one that's evolved a new antibiotic we haven't found yet to help us out. That one of the ways is they're picking up the information from ones that have spontaneously mutated in such a way that they produce these enzymes or different um, ribosome sequences and lots of different other things that they can change to then become resistant. Different mechanisms. So, um, what did I want to say? Oh yeah, there was a, several years back, there was a gentleman named Mr. Speaker. Kind of strange name, but that was his name. I didn't follow it. I didn't keep up with it. But he had multi-drug resistant. There was the fear that he had extremely multi-drug resistant, but apparently it was just multi-drug resistant strain of tuberculosis and got on an airplane. What? Yeah, yeah. Apparently, you know, his doctor didn't tell him he couldn't go to this wedding in Italy or something. Yeah, right. I was following it there for a while, and I think, thankfully, because y'all, this is, tuberculosis is, is, is very contagious. You would have to inhale from some respiratory droplets from him that contained as little as 10 bacteria, and you could get this infection. So he could tell you had, and you guys could have been, oh my God, He could have coughed in your face, you could have inhaled it, and gotten tuberculosis from that idiot. Right? Um, yeah, well, yeah. Um, <laughs> um, yeah. Um, thankfully, like I said, I, I never saw any reports on the CDC that anyone got it from him on that trip. I don't know. What, I, don't, I don't remember all the details. It's been several years. You could search the CDC's website for Mr. Speaker and tuberculosis, and I bet you'd find the information. Um, so another one that's quite interesting um, and I can't remember if, if they found any clues to exactly how, because there are other ways. Transformation is just one way. Transduction, which you learn about in lecture class, where, where viruses pick up bacteria, DNA, and transfer it to another bacteria, that can happen. Uh, another thing can happen is the two bacteria can join with each other and be a conjugation. The DNA can travel from one bacteria cell to another. So there's three known ways that DNA travel. This is just one of them. But the pathogenic strain of E. coli, known as E. coli 0157H7, the reason why it's pathogenic is it produces a shiga-like toxin, 
Um, this toxin gets its name from Shigella. So Shigella produces this toxin, and it's one of the pathogenic effects of this bacteria, is that it literally kills the cells lining your intestines, right? It's very toxic. Well, this particular strain of E. coli has a toxin just like the Shiga toxin that it produces, does the same thing too. So the belief is that it probably got it from its cousin, Shigella, right? It got the DNA on how to make this toxin from his friend, Shigella. That's how it happened. Because this is not common in E. coli, right? If it was, we'd all be in trouble because we all have E. coli in our gut. Okay. So in order for the bacteria to actually take up the DNA from the environment, they have to be what's referred to as competent. And naturally, only 1% of bacteria are competent. So we want more than that, right? <laughs> for this experiment to be successful, if only 1% of the bacteria in our tube take it up, then we're not going to have a lot of glowing green E. coli, right? Um, this process they found is actually quite complex. Um, so for instance, um, to be able to, to take DNA in from the environment, there's about 40 different segments of DNA, what we call genes, that code for different proteins that have different abilities in Bacillus subtilis that allow its ability to um, do transformation. So it is, can be quite a complicated process. It does require energy. Right? So the cell has to actually expend energy to take in this DNA. But it could be a benefit for them, right? And they believe this was a way that, especially for bacteria, because they have a single chromosome, and they only have one copy of most of their genes, this might be a way of repairing information, right? If they took up DNA from cells around them that were dying, then they could fix sections of their DNA that were damaged. Because when they do this, they literally swap out a section of their DNA if they integrate it into the chromosome for the stuff they took in, right? So it makes sense that it might have been evolved as a repair mechanism. So there's a reason why they might want to expend energy, right? They might need to repair um, under those conditions. So typically, you know, under stressful conditions, this is when they're going to do it. Um, it could also be viewed as a primitive form of sexual reproduction. Um, because what sex actually is, is exchange of genetic information. All sperm are mole DNA, right? But we need it. We need that other half of the DNA, right, to make another organism. Uh, where bacteria don't have to sexually reproduce, right? They don't have to share genetic information with other cells in order to reproduce. So we can artificially make cells competent. One way is electroporation, so you use electrodes, we throw electrons at to push the DNA into the cells. This of course requires um, fancy equipment, <laughs> right, which we don't do enough of it here at Delgado to warrant buying um, the, this fancy uh, equipment, uh, which is of course expensive. But in labs that do a lot of it, then they would, you know, invest in this type of technology. Instead, we're going to do the low-tech version. We're going to use chemically treated cells. Um, and in your little tubes I handed out to you is this solution of calcium chloride, which they believe these positively charged uh, calcium ions kind of shield um, and allow the entry of the negatively charged DNA into the cells. So um, DNA is highly negatively charged, right? But the positive cations of calcium bind to it and they neutralize it. So it's no longer charged and then it can slide through the membrane more easily. Only, stra only one strand is going to enter. The other strand actually gets digested away by uh, proteins in the membrane of the cell. So there are, of course, commercially available kits that you can purchase. Um, this is one that I used quite a bit in the lab when I was adding DNA to bacteria. The main reason why I was doing that in the lab was to get it to copy the DNA. You can do copy DNA in a test tube using polymerase chain reaction, PCR, 
but you can't do really long segments of DNA. So you'd have to do a lot of that. Where a bacteria will do really long segments of DNA um, if you insert them into them. And so they're, they're really good, efficient copy machines, you could say, bacteria are. Uh, and so they can be used to copy genetic information, and then I sequence that information um, once I took it back out of the bacteria. This is kind of cool stuff. So there's different levels of efficiency, how well they will um, take up DNA and incorporate and, and utilize it. And again, it just depends on what type of experiment you're doing as to what level of efficiency you would use. The kit that we purchased from BioRad has a particular efficiency rate as well. Right? It's already been known and calculated uh, for us. So they give you everything you need. They give you the uh, a positive control plasmid in addition to the, the DNA you may be using so you can make sure that the transformation actually worked. Uh, they give you the food necessary and they give you aliquots of the competent E. coli cells. So I have an aliquot from BioRad that I um, streaked onto plates and so I already have the competent bacteria growing on plates in the incubator that I'll take out to give to you guys. So as we said, bacterial transformation is that process of taking DNA from the outside and incorporating it in. Competent means having the ability to take in the DNA, right, to be transformed. Another thing that we're looking at today is bioluminescence. And so these green fluorescent proteins and the red fluorescent, all these fluorescent proteins, anyone know where they originally came from? From jellyfish, right? From jellyfish. So this is also the reason why sometimes if you go to the aquarium, depending on what species of jellyfish you're looking at, they're in those kind of dark aquariums, um, and they may be under UV light, so you can see the fluorescent ability. One of my favorite ones there at the aquarium, though, um, has these little cytoplasmic projections, they almost look like cilia, that beat along its surface. And so it looks like little rainbows on their surface as they move. And the reason for this is because of those little projections that are kind of like cilia, they act as little tiny microscopic prisms. And they're bending the light and, and separating the light into the different colors in the spectrum of, of light. Uh, so if you actually read the plaque next to it, it tells you that, right? But that's why, like, if you watch them, they kind of look like they're, they've got color rainbows just running along their edge. So those guys aren't fluorescent, but they're still pretty cool. They're one of my favorite ones to look at. The fact that, you know, jellyfish usually produce, you know, stinging cells, that's a whole other area. So you can get real technical as far as it goes for how fluorescent works, but these proteins have the ability that when fluorescent light shines on the organism, this excites electrons, moves electrons. And when they bounce back, they, they emit light, right? And depending on the, the proteins involved determines what color of light based on how far the electrons bounce. That's the, late, the short version of the explanation, right? So we're absorbing right, light and exciting electrons when they bounce back to the ground state, it creates fluorescence. And the UV light causes the excitation. So you can, you can chemically, um, you can mathematically calculate this even. Um, and so, again, depending on where, what the wavelength is, is why we, we end up um, within the visible green light spectrum that we see. So... All the conditions have been worked out for us, right? This is a kit. We know how much bacteria. I know how much transformation solution to put in there. I know how much plasmid to put in there. We know how much to plate onto your guys' plates, right? So we know how many cells to use. We know how much DNA to use, right? We know the efficiency. So we should get, um, after spreading 100 microliters of cells onto a plate, we should have about 75 cells that transform. So you should hopefully end up with 75 little colonies on there, right, that are glowing, fluorescent green. The plasmid that we're using today is a design plasmid, right? It's a kit we bought from a company. It's known as the P-Glow plasmid. The reason for that, again, is it contains 
a gene, so DNA, that tells the cell and gives the cell the ability to make green fluorescent protein. So that's what GFP stands for, right? Green fluorescent protein. And it was originally um, found in jellyfish. The other thing that this plasmid has, because it's got to have it, otherwise the cell is not going to copy it, because the cells will actually copy this as well, is this site of replication. This is where enzymes bind, and they'll actually copy this DNA, this circle of DNA. The other two genes on here are BLA, which stands for beta-galactinase. So this is an enzyme that will digest beta-lactam drugs. The drug we're going to use today is ampicillin. So we're going to take this enzyme, right, that can digest ampicillin, and we're going to put it into our bacteria today. We're going to make them ampicillin resistant. No one's scared? No one's worried about that? Why are we even doing that? Why would we want to make something resistant? <laughs> okay, well think about this. Are all the bacteria going to pick up this plasmid today? In our little test tube, we're going to have, you know, I don't know, a million ba bacteria, E. coli. Are they all going to take in the plasmid? No. So the ones that don't take in the plasmid, if we put them on plates containing ampicillin, are they going to grow? No, they're going to what? They're going to be killed by the ampicillin. The ones that took in the plasmid, though, guess what? They're going to grow, aren't they? Because they're resistant. So that's a way of us being what? No. Think about the plates that you guys just took a <laughs> quiz on. What did those pl plates do? Some of you guys didn't have any growth on those plates, right? Why not? Those plates were what? They were selected. Ah, that's how we're going to select for transformants, right? Is using ampicillin resistance. We're going to select. Okay, so next part is we're going to select, but your DNA, right? In all of your cells is all the information for your cells to do what they need to do. Do you think your red blood cell has the exact same DNA as your liver cell? It does. It does. But they're different, aren't they? Are they using different parts of that DNA? Absolutely. So red blood cell, what protein does it make a lot of in order to do its job? What protein? What pro What do red blood cells do? What do red blood cells do? Why do we have them in our body? No, red blood cells. Hemo you're right. Don't second guess yourself. It's hemoglobin. It carries what? What gas do we need traveled? Oxygen. Oxygen. Right? So you that red blood cell, right, uses that gene code in, in your DNA a lot to make hemoglobin, right? Because you need a lot to do that job of carrying oxygen. Do you think your liver cell makes hemoglobin? No, because he doesn't need it. He has a different job, right? He's making other things in that DNA. So the environment of our body, too, really determines who becomes what, right? If you're a, a stem cell in the bone marrow, you may be stimulated to become a red blood cell. If you're a cell in the liver, right, and those cells are dividing, you're going to become more liver cells or hepatocytes, right, and do what liver cells do. And so it's the environment in the body, right, that's going to determine what you're going to become. Well, let's think about a bacteria. It's a single-celled organism. But does the environment affect what he's going to do? Absolutely. So we already learned last week because of what plates um, that... E. coli loves lactose. Yeah, the eosinmethylene blue plates, because those contain lactose, right? And he can ferment it, and he turned what color on those plates? That was beautiful. That metallic green color, right? Showed us that they could ferment lactose. So, E. coli in your gut. 
If you give him lactose, man, he's excited. It's like lactose party, right? And so some people we say are lactose intolerant, right? Because guess what? They feed the lactose to their E. coli and their E. coli grow rapidly, right? And they'll even ferment. And what are some byproducts of fermentation? Gas, right? So that can cause gas and constipation or diarrhea and that overgrowth of that bacteria from all that sugar you just gave them right can cause those types of side effects so one of the easiest ways to fix that sort of is don't eat lactose but what's the problem here e coli is in your intestines right you eat the lactose goes into your stomach what's the next part small intestines what normally happens in your small intestines it breaks it down, and where does it go? Into your blood, right? To feed your cells. So for these individuals, guess what's not happening? They're not digesting it. They're not absorbing it. So then it goes to their large intestine, E. coli goes, party time! So there's one way to fix it, don't eat it. The other is also take enzymes when you do eat it to break it down so you can absorb it so that it doesn't get lactose part. So is it an enzyme trying to break it down before it gets to your stomach acid? No, it, it, um, those enzymes, oh, that, yeah, the enzymes would break it down um, before it gets to your stomach, I think, but I'm not sure exactly how those work. The lactate, the lactase enzymes that you can take that break down lactose. Uh, but I know they exist. <laughs> I haven't looked into exactly how. I don't have that problem with your face. Okay, so how is it that cells control these things? So yeah, it makes sense. The environment, somehow they have a way of sensing it, right? And we obviously have some way of controlling what gets used and what get, doesn't get used in our DNA, right? Nowadays, we actually know that it's proteins that physically bind to the DNA that control whether that DNA is used or not, okay? These are called regulatory proteins. And this gene that we've given them, we've given it within a system that regulates the expression of genes, what's referred to as an operon. So that protein that actually binds to the DNA, we also have to give them the ability to make that protein. And that's what AR, ARAC is. It is a protein that modifies the expression of GFP. So we're going to zoom in here on this region that can, that offers control. We're going to get to the, the fun stuff soon, I promise. <laughs> okay, so some terminology. Operons are segments of genetic information. It functions in a coordinated manner. Within that site, you have an operator, a promoter, and two or more what we call structural genes. What structural genes are, are this is DNA that's made into messenger RNA that's made into proteins. And they do something in the cell, right? So they can be structural, but they can also be functional, as in they could be an enzyme to, say, digest a sugar. So it's not really energy efficient for E. coli to always make the enzymes to digest lactose, especially in the environment of our gut, right? Because what's the chance they're going to eat lactose? Unless you're lactose intolerant, he's probably never going to see lactose, right? So why would he make the enzymes to digest lactose? There's really no reason to, right? But it would make sense that if lactose is there, since he likes it so much, he'd have a way of detecting that, right? and produce the enzymes that are needed to digest lactose, or especially even take it into a cell, right? So remember, we looked at a permease last week. So what permease do your cells need in order to turn your citrate tubes from green to blue? Citrate permease, right? They need that protein. They've got to make that protein, have it in their membrane, and be able to take in citrate. Now, for these organisms, they either have it or they don't. Where for E. coli, when certain sugars are present, they have receptors on their surface for it and ports to take it in. 
And once they recognize it, they're going to make even more ports to take it in and produce the enzymes to digest it. Right? So they're going to kind of upregulate this expression. One of the ways that all of this can happen is, as I said, that we directly interact with the DNA. Right? Proteins control and directly interact with the DNA. So I have pictures for this, right, because some of us pictures are better, right? So we'll just go through the terms and then I'll look at the pictures. So there's a segment of the DNA that is the reg those regulatory proteins are going to bind to. That's referred to as the operator. Now it depends on the type of regulation, right? So inducers, as the name implies, is going to cause um, things to be expressed. If you decrease the effectiveness, then you're talking about a repressor. Where if we're increasing, those proteins are, or those um, components are usually referred to as activators. We're going to actually use a system that uses activation. So in the key, case of the arabinose operon, which is the one we're using today, so that sugar arabinose can be digested. And we tricked them though. Right? So we use that system. This is the gene for the protein that is the inducer that the activator is going to bind to. In order to go from DNA to RNA, you need an enzyme that's going to copy that information in DNA into RNA. That protein is called DNA, I mean, RNA polymerase. It makes RNA from DNA. That enzyme binds at a specific site on the DNA. That site is referred to as the promoter, right? Because it promotes transcription. So one of the structural genes that we're going to trick him, right? We're going to be like, okay, here's some sugar, right? So all that, that, that operon, that operator, that protein, that promoter are all designed for, for arabinose. But instead of sticking the structural gene there that makes enzymes to digest arabinose or maybe some um, permeases to take in more arabinose, we tricked them. And we stuck green fluorescent protein there. So when we put sugar in, guess what they're going to make? Green fluorescent protein. See how we tricked them? Right? Okay, so let's, let's look at, so this is the sugar. Right? There's a rabinose. It's in one of the plates I'm going to give you guys today to plate your bacteria on. So um, here is the operator, right? And the regulator protein binds, and that is the product of AR, ARC gene, right? So that one's not under control. As soon as that plasmid goes in, they're going to make AARC, that protein. It's going to bind to the operator. Right? But the way this guy works is this section right here of the DNA, known as the promoter region, where RNA polymerase binds, isn't available unless changes happen to this protein that are caused by the effector binding. In this case, it's the sugar itself, the arabinose. So when sugar is available, it binds. This region becomes available. RNA polymerase binds, copies these structural genes, right? Which would normally be to digest arabinose, right? Or create permeases to bring in more arabinose. Instead, what we've done is we're still using that operator, right? That regulator protein, the same effector, arabinose, but instead of enzymes to digest, when the RNA polymerase binds to the promoter, it makes green fluorescent protein. So we, we have this gene under control, just like cells do normally. They put their certain genes under control, right? Because you're, you're not going to have a liver cell make a whole bunch of hemoglobin, right? You want that cell making other things. So they're going to turn off that section of the DNA, and they're going to turn on other sections. They're going to make other enzymes. Where in your red blood cells, right, that gene is probably always turned on, right, always expressed. They're always making hemoglobin because you need it.
Okay. I'm not going over this page. It gets people confused. Okay. Um, so BLA, right, gene is to make the beta galactinase enzyme. This one is not under control. As soon as we give this gene, right, this DNA to our cells, they're going to make beta galactinase enzyme. And they better because otherwise what happens if we stick them on an ampicillin plate? They'll die. And we don't want them to do that. So before we transform these cells, do they have the beta galactinase enzyme? I mean gene. No, and they can't make the enzyme. After we transform them, if they're really transformed, are they going to have the beta galactinase gene? Yes. This is DNA, right? Genes are DNA. How are we going to know if they have it or they don't? If they die or not, right? Because if they don't have the gene, they won't make the protein, right? And in the presence of ampicillin, they will die. Or if they've been transformed, they won't. Okay, so step one and two, right, have been done for you. The tubes have been labeled plus and minus. Why do we have a plus and a minus? Why aren't they both the same? What are these for our experiment? Right, one of them is our experiment and one of them is our control. Which do you think is which? Plus is for the experiment. What are we going to add to the plus tube? What do you need in order to transform a cell? You're right, the DNA. We're going to add the DNA to the plus tube only. Right, so already in those tubes, as I said, is 250 microliters of transformation solution in each tube, right? Make sure you check and, and see a little bit of fluid in each one of those tubes. So that's been done for you. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to get our ice buckets and we're going to fill them with water. And then we're going to place the white floating rack tubes, right, which our tubes are in, and we're going to put them in an ice water bath. We're not going to put the foam racks in there. So I showed you guys, right, no contamination, right, no, no protein in that tube. There was no glowing, right? So that's why we shine the UV light on there, right? Make sure there was no protein, right, because it would, it would glow green, right? It's just DNA. So we put in the plus tube. I use the loop instead of the pipetter because I didn't think to go borrow it from biotech. Um, what would you add to the DNA minus tube um, if you were to treat it the same? So we just put some liquid in that contained DNA. What could we put in our minus tube to make sure that we actually did the exact same thing to both tubes? Put some sterile water in, right? But it's a, such a small amount, 10 microliters, it doesn't make a significant difference, okay? So we skip that stuff because it could just, you know, lead to possible contamination <laughs> if it wasn't sterile. Okay, so the presence of the genes that lead to ampicillin-resistant and green fluorescence are on this plasmid. We just introduced our positive DNA to, too. So recall... Before transformation, do they have the beta galactinase enzyme? No, they don't have the gene. They can't make the enzyme. After transformation, will they have that gene? Could they make that enzyme? Yes. Green fluorescent protein gene, do they have it before transformation? No. E. coli don't normally fluoresce green, right? No, no, no. Will they after transformation? Yes. The question is, will they express it? Okay. Leave the tubes on for 10 minutes. Right? The plates I've already labeled for you. So I think in the book they tell you to label the plates during this incubation. Right? We're going to uh, skip that step because I've already labeled them. The only thing I'm going to ask you guys to add 
is your table number to them onto the labels that are already there so that we know which group did what plates. The next step that we're going to do after our 10 minutes are up, you'll notice that water bath I have on in the back, right? And I was having a little debate on whether I should go by the thing that's saying 45 or the fact that the thermometer is actually th saying what it needs to say, which is 42. <laughs> so uh, I'm happy as long as the thermometer says what it's supposed to, right? The, the internal thermometer on that water bath might be a little off or something. Okay. So... Um, what you're going to do is you're, you're going to take your whole ice bath back there. I'll move some of that stuff so you guys can take your whole trays back there, right? Your little Tupperware things. Not yet. When we go. Take the whole thing. And then you just take that rack out. That's actually a floating rack. And you put it in the water bath, right? 42 degrees Celsius, right? Do you guys remember what 37 degrees Celsius that incubator is in Fahrenheit? body temperature. So this is going to be above that, right? This is around 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay? This is equivalent to like when you go on vacation and you jump between the swimming pool and the hot tub. Right? Our water bath is the hot tub. Our ice baths right now are what? The swimming pool. It's kind of shocking, isn't it? And guess what that procedure is called? It's called heat shock. <laughs> and we're doing that on purpose. We are stressing them out on purpose, right? When we bring it back there, how long is it staying in the water bath? 50 seconds. 50 seconds drags when you're waiting and goes by in a flash the minute you walk away. One person in your group cannot walk away, right? They're in charge. As soon as the, you tell them their 50 seconds is up, they grab their numbered rack and put it back in their ice bath and carry it back to the lab bench. There it will sit for an additional two minutes on ice. Right? This procedure, as I said, is referred to as heat shock. Right? So we're using temperature, right, as a shock. This is a stressful condition that helps facilitate the take up of the DNA by the bacteria. Because remember, stressful, stressful conditions are one of those things that will help them pick up DNA, encourage them to do that. No, they're already competent. We're encouraging them to transform. We're encouraging them to take the DNA in. Makes them more permeable as well and more likely to take in that DNA. And this time is important, right? They've They've done it out, and they found that 50 seconds is the most efficient, right? The, you get the largest number of cells. You go past that, you have a lot less cells, right, that actually pick up the DNA. It's too long. It's too much heat for too long, right? But if you don't do it long enough, the same thing is true, right? You're not going to get as many transformed cells. So our sweet spot, right, that we want to try and hit today is 50 seconds. Right? It doesn't have to be perfect, y'all. But we don't want to go too far one way or the other, right? Because then we're going to fall short. All right? Optimum, 50 seconds. So, and we are probably at that. So let me, okay. Uh, okay, so after the two minutes, you're going to take this rack out of the water bath, right? And you can set it on your lab bench. You, it's going to be wet. You can put a couple of paper towels, right? So you're not... Any, it's not going to be that much wet, but, you know, some of us don't like wet. <laughs> Once we do that, we're going to need to transfer 250 microliters of LB. This is media. This is food, right? So we're going to, we shocked the heck out of them, right? We heat shocked them. Now we're going to feed them, right? So we are going to use the larger pipetter, um, one that you guys have used before. But we'll go around and maybe um, practice, or whoever feels comfortable, do it first, and then you guys can practice some. So we're going we're gonna to feed both tubes. And again, you can use the same tip as long as you don't go down into the fluid, right, if you squirt above. But in case you make that mistake, I suggest doing your negative tube first and then your positive tube, feed that one next, right? 
Um, but uh, you could also just change tips. I've got plenty of tips. So whatever you feel comfortable with, I'm fine with. So we're going to feed them, right? So we used to use those, remember last time when we tried to measure one mill with those plastic transfer pipettes? <laughs> that was hard, wasn't it? They expect us to do that to one little line on those, which is 250. So I'm glad I have at least one micro pipetter because that's much easier to do. Um, right. Don't place it into the liquid. But we're going to use the P1000 to do that. So we're not using these little guys, right? Because look, it, we'd have to draw up to that line. That's, we had trouble at this line, right? <laughs> Forget about this line. <laughs> and I've got limited stuff. Uh, so after we feed them, we're going to leave them on the, on the desk for 10 minutes. And this one, we got to go 10 minutes, right? Why are we leaving them for 10 minutes to eat? They already took in the DNA, so now they're going to not really eat, but they're going to use that DNA, right? And what are they going to make? They're going to make the beta-galactin ice enzyme, and they're going to make the regulator protein AARC, right? Are they going to make green fluorescent protein? Not yet, because what do they have to have to make green fluorescent protein? That one's under control, right, of an operon that is controlled by what sugar? Arabinose. There's no arabinose in this food we're giving them, right? So the important thing is, is they're going to make the beta-galactinase enzyme, right? They're going to make that other protein, but they're going to make this enzyme so that when we put them on the plates that contain ampicillin, what's not going to happen to them? They're not going to die. Now, our negative tubes, we didn't give them any DNA, right? So are they going to make beta-galactinase? No. Why did we do a negative tube? Why didn't we put DNA in both tubes? What is that for our experiment, that negative tube? That's our control. Yep, that's our control. Okay. So, before we get to that one, we will take a break. What did I do? I want to. So, we, we solved the problem of 100 microliters, right? Considering we had 50 microliter fixed by pets, which you guys are going to use again next week. So, it's good. You've got some practice this week, right? Everyone will definitely get to use those little fixed volume blue pipettes next week because we have a lot of pipetting next week. Um, so, we solved the problem of just doing two squirts, right, of 50 microliters onto each plate, right, um, plus tubes onto plus plates, minus tubes onto minus plates. We used a, um, a sterile loop, right, for both plus plates and a different sterile loop, of course, for the two minus plates because we don't want to cross-contaminate. And you, I didn't have you guys tape them together. I took them and put them in the incubator. Um, so some questions related to these plates and what's going to happen. So what information is provided by the LB DNA negative plate? So this is a plate that just contains the LB, right, in agar form. So it's just food. doesn't have any additives to it. And we plated the DNA from the minus tube. Did we do anything to that DNA, that, those bacteria in the minus tube? No, minus means we did not add DNA, right? So they're, they're, they should be how the bacteria started out, right? Plain old E. coli. So should we see growth on that plate next week? It's just plain old LB. Why wouldn't we see growth? Yeah, but I didn't tell you there was any ampicillin in that plate. It's just plain old LB. There's no antibiotic in that plate. It's going to grow. This is our control, right, to show that the bacteria we started with were viable, right, and they can grow. After you heat shock them and all of that, they can still resist and they will grow, right? This media lacks ampicillin, so they should grow. 
Now, when we get to the next plate, right, notice this is LB ampicillin plate, right? This plate contains ampicillin. These bacteria did not get the DNA, so they're not resistant, right? And so should we see any growth on this plate next week? No, right? This is our control to prove that the E. coli we started with are sensitive to ampicillin. The ampicillin is going to kill them, right? You should see no growth on this plate next week. Does that make sense to everybody? Yes. Okay. Then we have two plus plates, right? So obviously only transformation can happen if we give them DNA, right? If we give them picoplasmid, so which plate should exhibit transformation? The ones that have positive on them, right? And we have two of them. We have LB ampicillin plates, LB ampicillin with arabinose plates. So when we look at them next week, only one of them's going to glow. The one with the what? Arabinose. The only one with the sugar is actually going to glow, right? Because it's going to bind to the repressor, allow the RNA polymerase to bind to the promoter, make the RNA, and then that is translated into the protein that will actually for us. Without that inducer, without that effector, right, without the sugar, it won't happen because we have green fluorescent protein under control. Right, with that operator. The efficiency, as I said, has been worked out. There's a certain number, a certain amount of DNA in that tube. Remember, there's a measured amount that I put into the tubes, right? So, and we measured everything. So we should, right, end up with, say, potentially 60 colonies of transformed bacteria on those transformation plates. Right? Um, so we're not going to calculate transformation efficiency, though. I'm not going to make you guys do that. But it'd be similar to uh, dilution, which you definitely want to review, right, if you had trouble with that. So in summary, our four plates, right? Our negative plates, our positive plates our ampicillin plates, right, and this very special plate. And do you guys notice one of them looked darker than the rest? Yeah. That's because we autoclave the sugar and it kind of caramelizes a little bit. Um, so that creates that uh, darker color, which is kind of nice. So as we said, right, this is going to have complete growth. There's nothing that's going to stop them from growing. We should see lots of growth on this control plate. On this other plate, they, we should see no growth, right? The bacteria should be killed by the ampicillin. Let's cross our fingers. That's the one I have trouble with. The ampicillin is, is um, heat sensitive. So when I add it to the agar, the agar has to be cool enough that it won't destroy the ampicillin, but the agar is still liquid so I can pour it into the plates, right? Like I said, these little plates look cute, but they're not fun to prepare. This plate, right, is transformed cells. So is it going to be a complete lawn of growth of bacteria? Are all your cells going to transform? No, right? Only some of them. Probably around 60 to 75 of them, right? So they're going to be spaced out in, as little colonies on your plate, right, because we spread them out. But when we shine UV light on that plate, is it going to glow? No. Because what is missing in the media of that plate? We need the arabinose. So this is the only plate that's going to be glowing next week, one of them. Right? When we shine the UV light on it, those colonies, again, because not all the cells are going to be transformed, but again, how are we selecting for transformed? What in this media is killing the, the non-transformed? The ampicillin, right? So remember, if they don't take it, the ampicillin is going to kill them. So only growing on those plates are transformed ones, and only the arabinose plate that contains that sugar that's going to turn on that gene is going to allow the production of green fluorescent protein. Right? It's the only one that's going to glow. So here is the four plates. 
right? So hopefully we see, right, pretty glowing plates next time. And I saw most of you guys already cleaned up too.